Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, now it is the uh, Pfizer Symposium. And uh, uh, first, uh, Professor Dr. Mohamed Sabri Adi will uh, speak about the balpocyclib from clinical trial to practice. Thanks, Professor Dr. Ergin, about your um, presentation. Uh, thanks for uh, Pfizer to supply me with their updated data about uh, balbocyclib. I will talk uh, today about balbocyclib between clinical trials and real clinical practice. You know that uh, we have in Egypt now the three CD46, either balbo or ribocyclib or abemocyclib. And uh, I wish from my lecture today to transform the experience how to select the optimal CD46 for each patient according to uh, many factors. So uh, it's, um, with no head-to-head -head trials, uh, it's a very hard job to select the optimal CD46 away from clinical trials because there is no phase three trials comparing uh, uh, each CD46 with other. So I will take the challenge today and I will start with the, um, uh, the first improved overall survival in breast cancer seen in metastatic setting, seen in the not in a Leonata BMB, seen in her to positive patients by Kilopatra trial. It's the first trial to show a significant improvement in overall survival in the patient with her to positive. Other than that, in neural type A at 2014, there is no agents or no therapeutic modality improving overall survival. That's why the 5,000 volunteers shared the patient population in nine uh, clinical trials, Palomas and Monalises and Monarch trial are 5,000 volunteers and heroes. They are um, uh, involved in the updates and the changing of paradigm of hormone treatment for them setting in the patient with ERPR positive. So they changed the way from 2015, 2015, that changes the practice started to be uh, a positive way uh, in achieving significant overall and PFS benefit. So the very accelerated pathway in the um, in the update started from uh, uh, 10 years ago by uh, intru uh, inclusion of M2 pathway, followed by era of CD4-6, followed by era of PIC3 mutations. Uh, we have now here in the a new era of equity pathway inhibitors. So uh, from this um, uh, time, we omitting giving chemotherapy in a first line treatment or second line treatment, even for cell trial treatment for the patients. Our main goal of treatment of those patients is time to postpone chemotherapy, maintaining response with metastatic disease, and also achieving overall survival benefit uh, for the patient with human A and B breast cancer. So this is the trials highlighting the uh, the very accelerated time for updates started seven years ago by Palomas and uh, followed by Mona Lisa in the first line treatment, followed by Monarch, uh, Monarch 3, uh, uh, followed by Mona Lisa 7, which is a um, heterogeneous trial, including first line and second line. Then uh, second line for Western combination with CD4-6, either with abibacyclib or with balbocyclib or with uh, uh, ribocyclib in these trials. So the treatment switched from the single agent to dual agent uh, from uh, tamoxifen or AI alone or fulvestrant alone uh, till combination with CD4-6 plus fulvestrant or CD4-6 plus AI either in first line or second line. So um, the PFS benefits, uh, um, you know that uh, we are, uh, when asked us about the optimal CD4-6, uh, the um, common uh, reply all of them have the hazard ratio, same hazard ratio. It's really um, fact. All of this um, ribocyclib, abemocyclib, uh, bulbocyclib has the same hazard ratio concerning BFS benefit. But in the overall survival benefit, it's different. Uh, we have uh, a little bit inferior overall survival in the Paloma trial rather than the LS3 and the Monarch 3 trial or 2 trial. So the, the question, which CD4-6 available or optimal to be used upfront or second line? If you are uh, guided by the trials, you will, show, you will uh, directly go to the overall survival benefit, which is the gold standard and uh, um, the bright goal of the any investigator to choose his drug. 
because it's easily, precisely, objective and quantitative, and also uh, tracking the patient in the PF2 after progression on the first line and uh, accurately uh, uh, defining the problem uh, and defining the patient uh, mortality after uh, PF2 after receiving second line after progression. So the overall survival is considered the most reliable cancer endpoint over uh, all trials. Uh, uh, also the PFS, but PFS cannot translate it to OS survival benefit because of a lot of factors. It may be translated like in ribocyclib, but in many trials, it not cannot be translated to OS benefit due to multiple factors. The most important factor is tracking the patients in the PFS2 after progression of the treatment line to receive second line. So in ASCO, last ASCO, they put a cutoff improvement of 20% improvement in OS survival with we clinically meningeal in patients with breast cancer. This, um, uh, this chart can show that uh, all of trial exceeding 20% uh, uh, improvement in the overall survival in the first line setting. Uh, the Palomas touches the, uh, um, the line, but didn't, uh, didn't improve 20% uh, more. Uh, and also the uh, Paloma 2 is failed to uh, have significant OS benefit. And I will explain uh, after that why. In the first line, you can see that's the Molida 7 and the Molida 2 trial. And Monarch 3 trial promised us next year that we have a mature OS benefit in the uh, 23 of September next year. Uh, but Palomas uh, failed to show significant OS benefit uh, because of multiple factors. In the second line also, the all fact Odyssey for sex has the same PFS, except the OS survival is inferior in Palomas, but significant in the Monarch 2 and the Monida 3 trial as a second line for Vestran plus yeah, CD4-6 for a second line. So uh, if you are guided by OS benefit, you should go for ribocyclin. But the question here, if selection depends on OS benefit is enough, to choose the optimal CD4-6? The answer uh, is no. Ribocyclic combination, not for all patients. You should uh, guide it by another factors beside OS survival benefit. So uh, uh, basically, we are not comparing between trials. There is no cross comparison between trials, uh, either for PFS or, or survival, because we have a lot of um, uh, different inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria and different patient population and different geographical distribution. So uh, uh, also, the, not all uh, trials are powered to answer uh, measured overall survival. And uh, also, the patient population is totally different between trials, as I uh, will highlight uh, after two slides. So. Uh, explaining why the Palomas fails to achieving OS benefit. You know that the Palomas is the first trial um, introducing CD4-6 uh, in the market by Paloma 2 and Paloma 3, either first line with the eye or second line with Sylvester. Uh, they uh, enrolled a little bit, um, a small number of patients. The uh, enrollment, the patients with primary resistant patients who have progressed one month within first line treatment of M1 disease. They enrolled patient with previously received the chemotherapy for a metastatic setting. It's not allowed by any trials further, either by Moniza or Monarch 2. It's totally exclusive criteria in the other trial. But in this trial, they included patient received chemotherapy for metastatic setting to allow to receive bulbocycle plus fulvestrant. And also the including Asian population, which is um, uh, have a more toxic uh, with balbocyclib than other populations. They have uh, to receive the um, lower doses of balbocyclib due to higher neutropenia. And also the, the main factor, uh, they said that we are lost our patients. Many patients, 60 patients from uh, Paloma 2 and Paloma 3 lost follow up. So you, can col you cannot collect accurate overall survival uh, with loss of 60% of patients losing follow-up in the treatment value. Here is the design of Paloma, two tri Paloma 3 trial. You can show that some um, patient inclusion criteria, they include the patient uh, who are primary resistant patients and also perimenopausal patients and perimenopausal patients are included in this trial. 
this is a patient population over three trials. You can see that um, in the Paloma 3 trial, you can see that 33% uh, 30, of patients have a prior chemotherapy for this setting. In MARC 2, there is no allowed to receive any chemotherapy in M1 disease. And also in MARC trials, no chemotherapy allowed for M1 disease to be uh, received ribocyclic. And also, uh, um, uh, patients uh, have uh, receiving bulbocyclic in the third line. There is no patient allowed in uh, MONAR2 and MONAR3 to have a second, th third line uh, uh, CD46. Only palomas allowed patients to receive two lines uh, for M1 disease, about 36% uh, to be enrolled in the trial. And this is uh, explain what I said that um, many patients uh, are also including in the Paloma 3 are a primary resistance. You can see that in the Mona Lisa 3 trials, there is 49% of patients were even TAM naive, didn't receive even tamoxifen for a MON setting. So the um, uh, Mona Lisa 3 is a very heterogeneous trial, including more than 700 patients, either first line or second line, but you should know uh, that uh, 49% of patients in this trial receiving ribocyclib plus, uh, um, plus uh, filvestrant with TAM naive for M1 setting or even adjuvant setting. So uh, this is a um, smart design of MONAS3, the including a very favorable patients, very heterogeneous, and also nearly 50% of them didn't receive any hormonal treatment for M1 disease. That's why the magnificent, uh, the marvelous um, PFS uh, seen in the um, over trials, nearly after 4.5 years follow up, we have four, uh, 54 months longest survival benefit ever in the old trials. And also either receiving ribocyclib in the first line or second line, there is a response, uh, uh, even the significant PFS 33.6 months for the patient receiving uh, ribocyclic for last investment in uh, Donovo patients. So uh, the question is, which is for sex uh, you will select? The MDT decides uh, they are neutral. They decide to give MDT, CD46 plus CI as a first line. And they wrote in prescription, we are deciding for CD46 inhibitor plus AI for these patients. But the pharmacist need a name, need to name the drug. Kindly inform us what you want. You want abemocyclib or bibocyclib or ribocyclib. The doctor is fair. He told her that's uh, all the same, has the same hazard ratio. Give the CD46 available. Do you agree with this? I'm not agree because it's uh, totally different between uh, toxicities and comorbid illness and patient population. So the overall survival benefit should not only control you to choose the optimal CD46. Drug-related toxicities, patient comorbidities should tailor your selection and should fine-tuning your selection for the optimal uh, CD46 for each patient. So this is um, public, public um, uh, pub publishment in the uh, last ASCO helped me in, our, in my presentation uh, about consideration in the frontline treatment and how to choose CD46, uh, the optimal CD46 for, for every patient. Uh, they highlighted that we have uh, uh, many factors um, uh, besides the overall survival benefit and uh, besides trials, we have neutropenia with, and the diarrhea and the thromboembolic events and the versatile transaminases and also uh, patient age and uh, comorbidities as cardiovascular and also uh, toxicities from the drug are controlling our choice. So discussion treatment option with the patient is a very valid point for selection of optimal CD4 sex rather than take the available drug in the pharmacy. So uh, we can see here that uh, they are different in toxicities. Neutropenia is more for with bulbocyclib and also ribocyclib. The abemocyclib is uh, uniquely in the diarrhea, but uh, also causing uh, anemia, but a little bit extent rather than bulbocyclib or ribocyclib. And here is that drug-related toxicities are different, quite different between every city for sex. And also even the comorbidities. You know that's a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, 
they uh, have a very bad experience with uh, abemocyclib. We patient with arrhythmia and bradyarrhythmia uh, cannot receive uh, ribocyclib. We should be with severe neutropenia cannot tolerate the formal dose of balbocyclib. So we have a lot of things other than trials uh, controlling our uh, challenge or ch selection. So uh, this uh, uh, toxicity of the drug uniquely, you know, the ribocyclib is highly contraindicated with tamoxifen. This line was withdrawn in the Monolith 2 trial. They withdraw the arm of tamoxifen plus, AR plus ribocyclib. And also the ondansetrone, you know, that's the even zofran. We are giving it to antimatic, can uh, prolong the diacuity interval if it is given with uh, uh, ribocyclib. So we should go to the drug drug interaction checker in Medscape and test every drug for its interaction with others. Because many drugs can be given with ribocyclib causing prolongation of TQTC interval. And also, balbocyclib, there is also drug drug interaction, but in lesser extent. And uh, uh, neutropenia, which is a very important issue in uh, balbocyclib. And abemocyclib, a drug of a lot of um, comorbidities and a lot of uh, interactions. And also um, contraindicated with inflammatory bowel disease. You cannot give uh, abemocyclib with patient with inflammatory bowel disease. The diarrhea will be a heroic. So uh, this is a um, toxicity from abemocyclib. You can, know, can see the diarrhea and the fatigue and also dysgosia, which is a uh, uh, loss of smell sensation uh, and translated by, uh, during COVID by many patients as a COVID infection. It is uh, um, not uncommon, but, uh, but seen in the patient receiving abemocyclib to have change in smell and uh, taste sensation. So uh, we have drug drug interaction, the lowest drug drug interaction with uh, bulbocyclib, ribocyclib and bimocyclib have a lot of drug interactions with other medications. We have here the real world evidence. It is the practical use of bulbocyclib after finishing of clinical trials. Uh, you can, uh, can see that uh, bulbocyclib used by uh, about 3 million American people over the last seven years uh, by real world data evidence. That's why the Pfizer collecting these patients retrospectively and highlighted the, the issue of real data or evidence in the patient with uh, receiving bulbocyclib with the eye or bulbocyclib with sylvestrant. We have uh, Madeline on MARI trial. We have uh, real uh, uh, reality X trial. We have Iris, Polaris. We have many trials, uh, post-Martin trial, uh, except the Polaris trial, which is a prospective. All these trials answer the questions, what happens in the patients receiving bulbocyclib, plus AI or hovestrant after clinical trial. We can see that um, they change the practice. In US, 40% uh, of patients before era of C4-6 are receiving chemotherapy. After era of C4-6, they declined to 13% only using chemotherapy. And also uh, across 3 million people, uh, uh, either iris trial or platinum trial or paralysis trial, the real practice with bulb cyclib have um, uh, uh, good impacts concerning PFS and overall survival. In the iris trial, uh, it's a retrospective trial uh, discussing the, uh, all of three countries about dose reduction uh, uh, in the United States and Argentina and Germany. There is no dose reduction needed uh, for the patient receiving bulb cyclib. And also, the, all of them are receiving uh, 125 milligram per day. Uh, no adjustment, uh, those are what needed for those patients. In the, also, the median PFS uh, is 24 months, uh, and also median PFS is, uh, in second line, is 11 months in the median uh, PFS assessment. And also, 90% 90, uh, 90 of them are still survived after two years. Also, the men, breast cancer, extrapolated, um, the two, two minutes, please, a couple of slides. Okay. Uh, the men breast cancer extrapolated the indication of bulbocyclid from the post-Martin trial. I will highlighting the slides very rapidly. You can see here in the prior trial, it is a prospective trial, uh, testing the bulbocyclid given out of uh, indications in clinical trial. They use bulbocycle plus a vessel in the first line. It's not, uh, um, it's not applied in the 
primary trial uh, in the Paloma 3. Uh, say we can here give balbucycle with filsant either first line like another three trial giving ribocycle with AI a blast in the first line. So um, this is the data from Polaris trial, and this is the, the most updated Reality X trial. They uh, have a retrospective data um, um, about uh, three million people are um, retrospectively analyzed by these data with um, a special uh, high um, number of patients with availability of uh, um, control arm to allow comparison between balbocyclib and the eye only and follow up sufficiently and use of a technique of uh, a statistical technique uh, just stabilize inverse probability to, um, to have retrospective study as far as prospective. You can see here this of, after this uh, analysis, we can see the curve is separated for standing over survival for the bulb cycle. Uh, I will highlight these two minutes, this case of 50 years old lady, Donovan with breast cancer, learn type A, presented with uh, uh, chest pain and bone aches. She uh, diagnosed as bone mets with nodal pelvic metastasis, and she has a severe pelvic pain and uh, um, may have a, a fracture in the neck of femur, uh, make, her, uh, make her a bit ridden. So she has also a comorbid of cardiac bradyrrhythmia controlled by pacemaker, and also bed ridden because of a fracture in the neck of femur. What is the proper CD4 sex for this case? To give ribocyclib or bulbocyclib or abemocyclib? Ribocyclib in these patients was excluded because the patient have a uh, physician um, uh, about cardiac bradyrrhythmia. It's not compatible to use ribocyclib in such case. And also when the discussion with the patient, she refused to abemocyclib because she has a bed ridden, uh, she cannot tolerate a diarrhea to, uh, to move uh, up and down to the um, bathroom uh, to void because um, diarrhea in the bed ridden a patient is catastrophic adverse events. So the, cha the challenge with these patients with bulbocyclib is suitable for such patients, not other uh, the available drug. So my home message, OS benefit may guide you in selection, but should, no, should not be the only parameter for selection. Patient comorbidities, cardiac arrhythmia, inflammatory bowel disease, other uh, drug, drug interaction, should guide you for optimal selection of CD4-6 inhibitors. And updated data from clinical trials is very important to be updated. And accurate clinical evaluation to every patient, deep knowledge of patient comorbidities, adverse events and each, uh, for each CD4-6, make an oncology uh, art rather than a job. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh... Yes, Mohammed Sabri, uh, and uh, unfortunately, because we are uh, uh, from the time, uh, and for the sake of the time, unfortunately, so uh, uh, maybe we can postpone any questions uh, personally with you uh, after the session uh, is opened. Okay. It's an honor to me to introduce uh, Dr. Anivin Gadu uh, uh, um, to have us speak today about uh, mm -hmm. new hope in BRCA positive in said breast cancer patients. Okay. Um, uh, today, I will uh, discuss with you one of the maybe uh, very important topics, which is uh, what about these patients that we are uh, faced uh, in our uh, practice uh, that are metastatic, and when we do for them the PRACA testing, they are mutant. As you see here that in the NCCN guidelines, the uh, most uh, recent one, they highlighted that all the patients that have stage four metastatic or they have local recurrence so they have to go for doing uh, the biopsy first why in order to have 
the opportunity to test for any uh, germline and somatic uh, profiling in order to help decide which targeted therapy that the patient can receive. So what about the local and the regional recurrence treatment? If the patient has this uh, local uh, recurrence only, so he has the right, if it can be done, to do a surgical resection, if this is possible. And after that, if the patient, unfortunately, is not resectable, so we will go for the systemic therapy. These are just a table showing uh, by the category one level of evidence one, as you see here that any patient having this recurrence, you should go for PRACA testing. And if this patient uh, is proved to have this uh, PRACA positive, so she has the right to receive these ol uh, olaparib or the telazoparib, which are the PARB inhibitors. If the patient is hormonal receptor positive and HER2 negative, so we can go for a PCR test for the BIK3CA mutation. And if it is proved to be positive, so we will go for the Alpsilib plus the fulvestrant. What about the triple negative? In this situation, we will do immunohistochemistry testing for the BDL1 and we will consider it positive if uh, the score is 10 or more. And in this situation, the patient can receive PEMPRO, which is the immunotherapy, in addition to the chemotherapy, or we can give if it is not uh, available. So we can go for uh, chemotherapy, like, for example, uh, taxanes uh, or a pack, a gem and carboplatin. And all of these have category one level of evidence. So if we will go for the treatment algorithm for the metastatic triple negative uh, breast uh, cancer cases, we will do the BDL1 testing, okay? And according to its result, we will do either if it is positive, so we will go for uh, doing uh, this uh, BRCA testing. And here comes the question. In the first line treatment in such cases, what can we give? Shall we go if both are positive, the PRACA positive and the BDL1 positive? Shall we go for which of them? And unfortunately, there is no treatment of choice in such situation. So you can give this or that. And in the second line, if the patient didn't receive the uh, uh, PARP inhibitors and she's still, uh, you have to go for the biopsy another biopsy if the patient progressed. And if she's still PRCA positive, so we can, and didn't receive in the first line the BARB inhibitors, so there is no problem to go for this uh, BARB inhibitors. And if she is negative, so unfortunately uh, you can't give it and you will go for the standard chemotherapy. In the third line, there is the sakitizumab, which uh, if available, you can give her. And if it's not, so we will go for the standard chemotherapy. If the patient is BDL1 negative, what can we do? We will test for the PRACA as we uh, agreed in the beginning. And if the patient is positive, go for BARB inhibitors. If available, if she's negative, so we will go for standard chemotherapy, either in the first or the second line uh, uh, setting. Here, you, we, I will show you uh, uh, quickly the mechanism of action of the telazoparib, which is a PARB inhibitor, where it's very well known that it inhibits the uh, what is known as the uh, single-stranded break repair. It inhibits this. And in this situation, how do this happen? It happens through two mechanisms, either that she, uh, the, the, the telazoparib uh, do a trapping for the PARB uh, sites. It's the say, it's to, that's to say that it does, it goes for isolation. It prevents this, it straps this on the sites of the DNA damage, or that it goes for inhibition of the catalytic activity for the PARB uh, receptors. And uh, based on this, 
this would result in what's known as double-stranded break in the DNA. And in this situation, this break is not reversible and it will lead to the death of the tumor. This is uh, a list of the, uh, on the left side, you can see a list of the uh, different uh, BARB inhibitors and is shown here the potency of the B, uh, of BARB trapping. As you see here that the highest potency is for the telazopirib followed by the nirapirib, then the rucapirib, olapirib, and lastly the veliparib. The Imbraca study, it is a, a phase three a randomized uh, study which was carried on more than 400 uh, patients from uh, 16 countries and 145 sites. In this study, they recruited the patients who have HER2 negative and uh, they are locally advanced or metastatic with germline mutation uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2. And they stratified these patients according to the uh, number of chemotherapy regimens they previously treated or according to being triple negative or hormone receptor positive. And also, which is very interesting in this study, they recruited also those patients who had CNS metastasis. And it's very important because this subgroup of patients we are faced with, and sometimes it's difficult to decide which uh, treatment or which regimen uh, protocol to give. And this randomization was in the uh, two to one, where the telazoperib was given as an oral daily dose, one milligram, uh, given uh, for 21 days, and it was continued until either progression or there is toxicity. Uh, this, in contrast with the other arm, which uh, in includes the patients who receive chemotherapy in the form of a capcitabine, aeropilin, gemcitabine, or venerolpine. The primary endpoint in this study was the progression-free survival, and for the uh, secondary endpoint, it was the overall survival or the overall response rate and the safety also. If we look for the patient characteristic in this study, you will find that uh, uh, th there is a very important thing that I want you to pay attention for. You will look here for the, per the percentage of the females, you will find that it is 98.6. That's to say that there are a certain number of males that were included in this study. Also, the different performance status were included, and as you see, uh, they are uh, equal for the uh, patients with uh, zero performance or one. Uh, the two, it's very low percentage of patients. Uh, also, the locally advanced were not the majority, but the majority were about 95% of the cases in the metastatic one. Also, when we look for those patients who are, were uh, PRACA1 or PRACA2, they were nearly uh, equal. Uh, also, uh, when we look for those patients who had less than 12 months a disease-free interval from the initial diagnosis uh, in the local advanced or metastatic, they were nearly equal in both arms. Uh, lastly, what about the patients that received previously a platinum? They were 46% uh, uh, for this, uh, they were 16% in the telazoperib and uh, they were about uh, 20 uh, in the uh, chemotherapy arm. So as you see here, the, the progression-free survival curve is in favor for the telazovirib, having a median uh, progression-free uh, survival of uh, uh, 8.6 uh, in contrast to 5.6 for the chemotherapy arm with a hazard ratio of 0.54. They went for subgroup analysis and they found that, as you see here, that most of the uh, character different subgroups, they are in favor for the telazoperib, uh, whether we are speaking about the performance status, the BRCA testing, the uh, hormonal receptors or the triple negative uh, patients, the uh, presence of the CNS, you may look here, that it's in, in great favor for this, uh, the use of the telazoperib. For the uh, receptor expression, did it differ? Those patients who had 
triple negative from those who were hormonal positive, yes, a little bit, as you see here, that the median uh, progression free survival for the hormonal receptor uh, positive, it was 9.4 uh, in contrast to 5.8 for the triple negative, with also a, a difference in the hazard ratio. Does it differ if the patient received uh, no, didn't receive any prior chemotherapy or received more than lines of chemotherapy? As you see, the, there is no difference uh, between the three groups. What about the CNS? The progression-free survival for the CNS was in favor for the telazoparib uh, rather than the uh, chemotherapy, and this is a very important finding. The secondary endpoint, as I mentioned before, was the overall survival and the clinical benefit rate at 24 weeks. As you see here that uh, we had about 5.5% uh, of the cases had a complete response. And you can imagine in a metastatic setting that you succeed to attain a complete response with your patient. This is very important. The um, the uh, overall response rate that you see complete and partial response uh, were 62% in the uh, telazoparib arm in contrast to 27% only in the chemotherapy uh, arm. Uh, is there is any impact on the duration of response? Yes. They found that this uh, attaining this very good response, it was maintained uh, for at the, the year uh, one year, the, it was 23% having this maintained response in contrast to 0% for the chemotherapy arm. And not only this, if you look for the curve, you will find that even at 33 months, there is still a response for the telazoparib arm. The final overall survival, unfortunately, it didn't show significant difference. And when they looked in the subgroup, they found that most of the subgroup uh, of the uh, patients, they were in favor for the uh, telazoparib arm. Uh, this how had uh, the performance status, the hormonal status, the PRACA, uh, also the patients with measurable disease or visceral disease, all of this showed uh, uh, favoring the uh, telazoparib arm. And uh, if we look also for the other uh, subgroups, like those patients who uh, had prior regimens for uh, chemotherapy, uh, also it was in favor for the telazoparib. Uh, those patients who had prior received uh, prior uh, platinum, the same. And also, lastly, those patients who had received adjuvant or a new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. So if we look for here, the uh, different uh, antineoplastic treatment that we can give for those patients having uh, the uh, BRCA uh, mutation, we can look here and we can look, find that uh, chemotherapy, CDKs for, for six inhibitors, hormonal treatment, or even PARP inhibitor can be used in the subsequent setting. When we go for the PARP inhibitor, the subsequent PARP inhibitor or platinum treatment, does it matter if I started in the first line, the PARP inhibitors, will it affect the decision making for which agent will I give this patient afterwards? We found here that about nearly 48%, that's to say nearly 50%, uh, in the telazoparib uh, arm, uh, received a subsequent PARP inhibitor or platinum compared with 60% uh, in the chemotherapy arm. Yes. So what about the safety? Um, quickly, I will cover this because it's the time is finished. Uh, for the uh, safety, you find here that uh, the grade 3 to 4 toxicity was attained in 28% in contrast to 27% in the chemotherapy arm. So, of course, there is no added uh, toxicity. Uh, 
the number of deaths uh, that occurred was one case in either uh, uh, arms, with the serious, ad the, uh, serious adverse events was about uh, uh, nine uh, in the telazoprib and 8.7 in the uh, other uh, arm, the chemotherapy. This is very important, that the EU ERTC, uh, they made a questionnaire, which is the quality of life questionnaire. And they reported that the global health score, if we find it positive, that's to see on the left side with this blue uh, curve, this is in favor for that this agent didn't affect the quality of life of the patient, which is very important. That is not the matter of just having uh, uh, good uh, results, uh, but also not affect the quality of life. This uh, favors the telazoperib versus the chemotherapy as the quality of life. Uh, here, the study is converting the results of the olaparib uh, in contrast with the telazoparib. As you see here, that the progression-free survival for the olaparib was seven months, the median uh, progression-free survival, while it was 8.6 months for the telazoparib or uh, also, uh, for the adverse effects for the telazoperib, it's mainly hematological, mainly in the form of uh, anemia, uh, then uh, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, uh, besides the alopecia. But for the olaparib, it is in the form of GIT upset in the form of nausea and vomiting. So we have here just an overview of the three PARB uh, inhibitor studies in the advanced uh, setting. And you find here that they are nearly having uh, similar uh, results, except that this PROCAD uh, study, which included the taxol carboplatin uh, with or without the veliparib, you find here that uh, the prior uh, patients that had prior platinum were just only 8%. Also, prior chemotherapy in general were 19% in contrast to the other two trials that had more than 60% of these patients had received prior chemotherapy. Uh, the median progression-free survival is in favor for the last one, which is the Brocade uh, 3, which is 14.5 versus uh, 8.6 and 7 in the other two arms. So now we agree, all of us, that all the patients had the right to test it by the PRECA testing in the recurrent or the metastatic setting to identify which patient can receive the BARB inhibitor. My last slide, which is the take-home message, that uh, assessing the germline PRECA mutation in all the patients with the recurrent or metastatic a cancer to identify the PARP inhibitor therapy. Uh, Olaparib and telazoparib are both PARP inhibitors that showed improved progression-free survival with no overall survival difference. The Olaparib has the disease GIT, nausea and vomiting, while the telazoparib had hematological uh, toxicity. There is statistically significant improvement in the overall change from the baseline global health score, uh, which is very important in the quality of life for those patients who received telazoparib while a significant deterioration was seen with those patients who had received chemotherapy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rabin, about your elegant presentation as usual. Uh, any question from the floor? I have a question, please, Dr. Naveen Gado. It's your turn. <laughs> I have one question. Uh, if you have a patient with PD1 positive and BRCA positive, which uh, modality can you choose uh, in the upfront line for the patients then to receive any treatment? Yes. Form setting. Yes, uh, I mentioned this in uh, my uh, beginning of the yes. uh, presentation that there is no consensus which to which. You yes. know, you can uh, decide it uh, individual uh, according yes. to the availability, maybe the cost of the treatment, the of course the performance status of the patient. Yes. All of this is very important. You know, yes. but if the patient didn't receive either of them in the first line. There is no problem, you know, to go and give it in the second line. There yes. is no problem. But uh, but I uh, my input in this question that you have a solid data. If you are using anti-PD-1 
uh, post chemotherapy as a second line, you will have no response. Uh, if you are using PDL1 in a triple negative patients, if you're using anti PDL1 for a first line, keeping with Keynote uh, 355 or uh, uh, in Passion 130, you will have a very good response to PDL1 treatment. So I, I prefer to start with PDL1 and keep uh, barb inhibitors in the second line to have uh, effect and uh, optimal sequencing. Because if you use anti PDL1 post chemotherapy, after even chemotherapy or post barb inhibitor, you will uh, have uh, you have very modest response rate and PFS. Uh, uh, for me, I uh, maybe I uh, agree with you, but for me, there is no data for me to uh, to approve yes. this. But uh, of course, uh, anything you know, there is no there is no contraindication. In a keynote three five five, they excluded any patient receiving treatment for metastatic setting. They accepted only the late progressor after one year from adjuvant or within one year from uh, from uh, within one year from adjuvant treatment. They didn't accept any patient received a chemotherapy for M1 disease. That's why I prefer to PDL1 to be a start. And, and in if therapy. the PDL1 is not available, this means that you will never it's not available okay and you give this patient PARP inhibitors yes. so in this situation you will never use it after yes. this yes this so, right uh, for for post saving i will give chemotherapy or uh, secdesumab uh, as a second line or third line but i will not give pdl1 post barb barb inhibitors thank you uh,